Today's guest on Leave Your Mark is Joey Del Sardo. He's a Pittsburgh native. He's a standout football and basketball star at Seton LaSalle High School. And seeking a scholarship, he chose to be a walk-on at the University of Pittsburgh where he makes the team. And he is a three-year letterman. And he's a wide out, stand out, and he's known for his great hands and pass routes. He's also known for his highlight reel on top 10 plays on ESPN. And during this time of Joey's life, he's on top of the world and his dream life comes to a crashing battle with drug addiction. I want to thank you for being here today, Joey. Yeah, so, well, thanks for having me on, Vinny. Uh, I'm glad uh, a couple of Paisons could could get together. And, yeah, it's always yeah. good. There's going to be a lot of sauce here today. Joey, <laughs> Vinny, it's going on. Hi there, and welcome. Now it's time for America's, America's favorite, podcast. favorite podcast. Leave your mark with your host, Vince Cortez. If it's fly, loose fit it, it's Cortez. If freeze and chubbies in it, it's Cortez. Leave your mark is about inspiring the world, one guess at a time. Pass the word from Brooklyn to Pittsburgh, from urban to suburb, it's Cortez, you heard? And here is our host, Vince Cortez. If you would, please take me from the point of when you were injured in high school. Um, yeah, so going back to high school, you know, I was never, um, I was never one that was into to the drug scene or the party scene in high school. I uh, didn't really drink alcohol, let alone anything else, you know. And uh, going into my senior year, I'm I'm smaller, so I was having to fight for a scholarship. I was never getting really any offers early on and uh I got hurt my senior year and you know my thought process at that point was kind of just like how, how you gotta play you know you need to perform for these coaches and earn a scholarship so um it's just my mentality was I need to get on the field I didn't know much about any of the the painkillers that were were on the scene at the time I just knew a friend of mine was was injured and uh that's what he took when he was playing because he had you know a surgery and my thought was hey I'll take one of those and I'll play in uh in the game next week so that's what I did and and unfortunately you know I went in for one play and I got re-injured oh wow uh, and I was back on the sidelines so uh probably would have been worth it to just sit out you know, as opposed to to go that extra mile for you just one play. Now, in in this situation, so you had you had taken the medication for the pain, mm -hmm. and you experienced what the medication felt like for the first time. So, could you explain a little bit about that? I can remember sitting there, kind of nervous, not in the sense that it was like, "Hey, I know, I know what this may bring." It was more just the sense, like, you know, I. I'm doing something to, to, to play in this game. And to my, in my life, football was, was everything. Right. And mm -hmm. just like so many others, it's, it means the world to you. And all you want to do is, is strap it up on Friday night. Right. And uh, that was, that was my mentality. Even if, even if college or, or the pros wasn't my end goal, which it was, but I, I still feel the same way. Cause it, you only get so many Fridays you can play. And, uh, so I had a little bit of nerves just to just to go through the process. I didn't really ever take anything except for Tylenol before, which it was very similar. I just took a couple of pills, took a drink of water. And um, during warmups, I started to feel like just loose and more talkative and not really myself. Mm. Um, I guess coming out of your shell a little bit, you could say, and you weren't necessarily thinking about what you were saying maybe you just didn't have it like I didn't have a filter okay and I can remember pacing the sidelines begging the offensive coordinator to put me in put me in put me in and um you know looking back at it now I kind of probably freaked him out a little bit and some of the coaches that how ag aggressive I was being to get in the game and I go in the game for one play at the end of the second half and you know guy on my own team it runs into me and we, you know, bang my ankle and, and I'm out again. And I took a couple more pills and uh, it was just, I remember not acting like myself. So then the, the feeling of the uh, medication was what gripped you almost immediately then. Yeah. 
Yeah, it definitely was. It was, it was, um, nothing that was, was, I need this every day type of thing, obviously at that point after the first time, but it was like, you know, I like this. I like this feeling mm. and, um, dangerous, extremely dangerous. And especially for someone like me or maybe athletes in general who are, you know, a lot of, a uh, lot of alphas who just are, I need this, I want this and I'm going to go after it. I'm going to get it. And, uh, so I took it and originally it was, I guess, if you want to say for the right, right reasons, I, I was just wanting to play and I took okay. them before games and then you keep getting that feeling and, and, um, kind of your, I guess, thought process and morals. Cause I was never the type. Once I found out it was addictive, I would always say, you know, there's a limit. I'll have a limit. I'm just going to do it for games or practices. Uh huh. You felt like you could control it. Exactly. And then you do that and then it, you know, that, uh, that baseline or that, I guess, guideline and parameter starts to expand, you know, well, now I'll just take it for practices. Now you're still in high school at this point when you were introduced to this. Now um, your high school year obviously goes well. You're uh, of the mindset where you won that scholarship, as you mentioned, and you're trying to uh, be a standout on, you know, statistically with your play, however you can attract that attention and you decide to uh, go and be a walk on a pit. So, I mean, this part of the story gets very interesting because you experience uh, success. You make the team while you kind of got this skeleton in your closet going on. So kind of walk us through that part. Well, leading up to that, so just to kind of backtrack a, a few months, um, going through my senior year and when we got into the, the playoffs of senior year of high school is when I was f first introduced to heroin. Oh, wow. Now you're on a whole nother thing. It, it was a whole nother level. Um, I think at this point I started to justify it in my mind. Again, I said, I saw a couple guys using it and I said, no, for, this was for you know, a few weeks now. And I was always like, you know, I can't, I don't want to really associate myself with that drug. I don't want my name and that in the same sentence. And uh, I always said no. And then one week, I was just like, you know, I just want to see what it feels like. Because so many people said, well, it's like painkillers just magnified a little bit. And uh, so I said, I'll try it once just to see what it's like. And uh, I did it that one time and obviously uh, continued to do it throughout the rest of my senior year. Uh, sporadically, I would say, but I mean, before the state championship game where I, I was able to set a record for receptions, I was up till four in the morning, you know, um, partly because I couldn't sleep because of nerves. Um, I was, I was doing, mixing pills. I was doing heroin. So you would begin to mix the drugs? The night before the game. And I was kind of up all night with Par paranoia I, I i mean i'm not necessarily paranoid of something bad happened i was just i think nervous of the game i'd fall asleep i'd have some type of weird dream or something and i'd wake up and uh you know i just couldn't sleep and so that process kind of was on and off throughout basketball my senior year um and then going into my freshman year as a walk-on i actually was like listen i need to I need to start focusing and I, and I put those drugs down and I was just like, I'm, I'm back into football. I'm going to college. My goal is to play my goal is to start and get a scholarship. And so I really kind of put that stuff down for the most part, maybe here and there once a month or something like that. Um, but I wasn't re really seeking it out. Yeah, you, you actually, based on how that affected you, you showed an incredible amount of strength to be able to back off of that at that point. Because that when the drugs hit like that, it's kind of like a spiral effect. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for you to have the strength to say, you know, this isn't me or your identity still didn't match with what you were doing, uh, to, to put yourself back on track in the moment. Yeah, that that was that's impressive that that showed signs of uh being able to 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 have strength later on yeah i mean it was it was difficult you know f funny not funny but i guess odd thing is i never really knew about withdrawal and i would kind of go on and off it was you know maybe you do it one week more than you do it the next week 
And then somebody asked me if I got withdrawal. And I said, no, I've never, I don't even know what that is. And then I was going on a recruiting visit in uh, a, a smaller school in Tennessee. And that night before I couldn't sleep and I, I hadn't taken anything. And I was like starting to ache and feel sick. And I was like, wow, this must be, this must be withdrawal. Mm -hmm. And in my head, I'm thinking, man, if I just didn't know what this was, maybe I never would have gone through it. But someone brought it to my attention. And then that, like two days later, that's, that's how I felt. So, uh, yeah, you, you, you go through that stuff, but it, it wasn't as bad as, as those withdrawals later on throughout my addiction. But, uh, yeah, fortunately, I guess I was able to, to go and, and just kind of put it to the side while I was early on at, at Pitt and focus on just playing football. Now, just share a little bit with me about Pitt because uh, I was a high school athlete in that same situation as yourself where everything's about that getting on the floor. I played basketball and you, you, wanna, you want that scholarship so bad that you become consumed by that. So uh, to, to come from that point to make the team, I mean, you know, you, you didn't go on a lower level. You're a pit. You're at Division One level, the highest level of college play. So making the team, you know, uh, in, in the situation that most probably didn't know that you were in, it was almost like your own little secret you had going on. And, uh, you know, you come out, you become a starter. Uh, you, you, you're known for your athleticism and your play. Your leadership from your high school carries over. And, uh, you know, we're watching you on ESPN. I mean, yeah. you, you hit the mountaintop. Yeah, it was um, it was kind of surreal and um, but almost expected in a way. You know, I despite what I had done my senior year, I still worked extremely hard. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was able to go down and watch practices as a senior once I knew I was going to go to Pitt so that I could try and learn the offense. Um, you know, my quarterback throughout college, Tyler Palco, who's a Pittsburgh kid, um, would call me down that summer when I was just graduated high school. And most of the time at that point, it's scholarship guys, but I was a local walk on. So he would call me and I would throw with, with him and uh, which was a benefit to get, just extra reps on um, well, your timing. I mean, he's the starting quarterback, you know, that, that was what it was going to be like game time. He, that, that was actually a great uh, reach out that Tyler did. Yeah. Oh yeah. And you know, Tyler worked extremely hard too. And he was in the same, not the same boat, but a similar boat in the sense that there were two quarterbacks coming in both from Pittsburgh um, same year. And there was a guy who was a senior my freshman year, Rod Rutherford was a, was a senior. That's when Larry Fitzgerald was there. And then it was kind of known that once Ty, or once Rod leaves, Tyler and Luke are going to kind of battle it out. So oh, that's wow. the way he was. And, um, and a lot of, not a lot of people remember that Joe Flacco was part of that mix too because we came in the same year. Yeah, didn't he transfer? Yeah, he transferred to Delaware. Wow. That, that's a nice little inside story. No, not a lot of people don't know that. No, they don't. They, at least they don't remember. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I came in too. I was like 208 pounds. Like my thought was, man, I'm going to college. I need to be fucked and uh, be able to take some hits. And uh, you know, immediately when I came into camp, coach was like, you need, you need to drop about 20 pounds. Oh wow, he wanted you to get thinner, lighter, yeah. and faster. Yeah. So. Uh, so yeah, I came in and I, I was a walk on and I knew I just needed to do something. So I went to the special teams coach and I said, listen, I'll play whatever you want me to play on special teams. Just give me an opportunity. Um, I said that to the defensive coach, even though I came in as, as a, a wide receiver, I was also, you know, recruited for some time at linebacker and safety. Um, so I was like, I just want to get on the field. And, and I made the coaching staff aware of that. And I was able to start on some special teams as a freshman, which I think just helped with uh, the nerves maybe of, of playing at that level. I mean, I get, I got nervous before every game, but you know, after the first play, those go away. 
Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. That first hit is uh, always, <laughs> always the wake up call. Yeah. Yeah. So you kind of get through that um, your freshman year on a special teams level. And it's like, okay, well, I can do this, even though I was out there trying to block, you know, linebackers and tight ends and these big six, four safeties It, you know, I, I did what I could. Connect with us on LinkedIn. Be our friend on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Whether jumping out the MP or jumping on the app. You are listening to listening to Vince Cortez. Cortez. We just want you to leave your mark. Now, what you were saying that 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 worked out. So you you kind of broke through, and now you you come into your sophomore year, and it sounds like the the next level of success began. Yeah. So it was um, I can remember. So uh, again. When I go out and I speak, I talk about my process of going through PIP, but this is a this is a kind of the part I, I leave out because it's just, you know, too long. But going into my sophomore year, you know, I lost all this weight. I dropped down to like 184, 183, my spring of freshman year. So um, coaches were telling me, hey, listen, if you get if you're like one of the top guys in spring ball, you'll get a scholarship going into next year. So I led uh our one of our starting receivers from last year was going to be out for the season so that opened up a lot of opportunity um then another freshman wide receiver got hurt and i was the leading receiver in the in the spring game i had most catches i had like a reverse for 33 yards and a touchdown oh nice and so like the next week coach coach harris calls me in and uh I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready. I was staying at home at the time. I pop up, I drive down to Southside. I'm like, this is it. This is it. And he just rips me a new one for blocking assignments. Like, Hey, when we're running the ball, you blocked the wrong guy, you know, 30% of the time or whatever, you know, the number. <laughs> not, not what you were expecting to happen. It laid into me and I'm like, man, I, I thought I did pretty good. And that's kind of, it, it really helped me because that opened my eyes to, hey, this position entails more than just catching and, you know. And uh, running, yeah. And running. So it's, there's a lot more, and you really have to pay attention to those details. So then before the first game my, my sophomore year, um, he announced that I was, I was getting a scholarship. And I honestly wasn't even expecting it. There was a defensive lineman, but uh, his name was Ron Idoko. Ido, Ido, Ron Idoko or Doku, I, Ron. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> I forget the last vowel at the end of his last name, but um, I, I thought it was him because he was playing a lot during camp at defensive lineman. I'm thinking that's who it is. I mean, and then he said my name, and I was just like, what? And I, I ran inside. I called my parents up. I was, you know, in tears because um, they were at – my high school's Friday night football game. And uh, it was just a, an amazing feeling. Yeah. I mean, that was, that was an achieved goal that you, you had, uh, you had arrived officially. Yeah. You know, goal, goal completed. Yeah. So now you, you play how many games then as a starter, your sophomore year and a scholarship athlete? 12 games. Wow. So we, uh, we went eight and four that year. We lost, we won the Big East, um, which was kind of like a crazy thing. It was a three-way tie between us, West Virginia and Boston College. I think it was West Virginia and Boston College, but I know, I know Boston College was one of those teams. And then Syracuse had to beat Boston College for us to win and go to the Fiesta Bowl. So you so, went to the Fiesta Bowl too then? Yeah, yeah. No, that, that, that's Going to a bowl game in college is like going to a Super Bowl. I mean, you guys get treated like kings. Well, I'll say this. We went to the uh, – I forget the name of it now. It's in Charlotte. It's like the Meineke Bowl, but it's it was the Continental Tire Bowl. And we went to that my freshman year, which was, you know, they give you a hospitality room. We walked into this hotel room. There was like a broken Xbox, you know, a couple of things of chips – whatever and then you go to the fiesta bowl and it was you walk into this room they have xbox playstation um pool uh air hockey 
uh, tables and tables full of Tostitos chips, any kind you could ever imagine, <laughs> dips, Arby's roast beef sandwiches, like, you know, for lunch. And then they put another hot meal in there for dinner. And it, it's funny because you only have like three hours of downtime anyway. Uh -huh. you know I mean, you have like meetings, practice that you may have like media obligations or they have some type of thing you have to go to um, some type of event. So it was, uh, I'd say the BCS games are like going to the Super Bowl. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Now, so you go now into your junior and senior year and how, how is, how are you doing with your addiction with the drugs? So I was, um, I was doing much better. I was coming into my junior year. We had a new coaching staff. Um, I didn't realize it at the time. I was, I guess, kind of uh, naive to the fact I thought, I thought one, I'd proven myself that I could be a starter at this league. And it's like, the the difference I guess was the old coaching staff was like, I'm going to trust this guy to do what he's going to do and catch the ball where the second coaching staff was more maybe looking at potential um, of what they can do. So throughout camp, I didn't really realize it, but they were trying to replace me. And uh, so by week one, I, you know, I still beat everybody out. We played Notre Dame. I had a pretty good game. I think four or five catches for 80 yards, something like that. Um, decent, but we, I mean, we end up getting beat up that game, but, uh, you know, second game, we, we lo lose in overtime to Ohio university. And at that point, um, they were like, Hey, you're going to be like the third wide receiver. You're not starting in our two wide receiver sets. And that's where I kind of took it hard. And that's where I was like, started dabbling back into drugs. Mm. Um, throughout my junior year and I just dealt with it, you know, dealt with it in the wrong way. And uh, I think part of it was feeling ashamed, feel like I let my, like my, let myself down. I let my family down. Um, and I guess at that point you just want to, you just want to kill the pain of, mm. of that. And being in my, being in my hometown, as well um i think took took a little bit of a toll on me as well because a lot of the people who would cover us in sports i've i've known just from high school and and being around so uh yeah it was it was difficult it was a difficult thing um doing that or having to go through that i should say so now you're getting you're you're coming into your senior year and um, how does how do things begin to play out? So you slip back into the drug addiction. Uh, I'm guessing it picked up the pace again with the pain. But now, where where were you? Where where was your mind at as far as you know? You're gonna you're gonna graduate soon. You got to play uh, more than you thought in some cases, and less than you thought in others. And, and yeah. so you're sort of almost in no man's land. Yeah. Um, so we had the same coaching staff, obviously going into my senior year. And, um, we, one of my friends who was my year in college left early, he tried to go the, tried to go the NFL. He was a receiver. Um, he probably should have waited a year, but I think he just wanted to get out of there. And so I was still going through this drug addiction, I was still having to, you know, find these pills and going through it. Um, maybe I wasn't at my peak worst, but still going through it. But my mindset at this point was totally different from my junior year. I was optimistic about my senior year. It was my last year of football. Um, I was just thinking, I'm going to go into this. I'm going to give everything I got. And that's, that's all I could do at that point. So you recommitted. Yeah. Yeah. And, and going into camp, I, I felt good. I felt ready. And halfway through camp or so, I, I pulled my hamstring, which was 
I had tweaked my hammies before, but this was, I mean, this was painful. The hamstrings so, are, are devastating injuries for athletes. Uh, just to kind of throw that in there. Because uh, you lose that mobility and all the, 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 the quick twitch and everything that's not noticed or the insiders know. A hamstring issue is a big deal. That could end the season. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was tough. And I tried pushing. I, I, I felt like I was giving my all before this hamstring injury and and it wasn't really being noticed like I was trying to as soon as it's like guy would catch a hitch on the other side of the field I was trying to run over and get a block just you know doing everything I could which I didn't you know at that point I was like I don't need a pat on the back but mm -hmm. it just didn't ever feel right to me that it just felt like I, I wasn't in their plans even though I was at the time you know I was in like the mix of the top two or three receivers. I still didn't feel a part of what the plan was. That's difficult too. Cause I mean, uh, I'm, I experienced that myself uh, in my sophomore going into my junior, year, the coach that had recruited me was gone. And mm -hmm. the, when the new coach comes in, which you just mentioned, when you're not in the plans, it, it just, you feel like you're just going through the motions. It's, it, it's very difficult mentally. Uh, to feel like you can contribute. So yeah. Now, at what point in your senior year is this? Had, had a few games started, or you're still well, in the beginning? This was of the year? this was still camp. And oh uh, wow! So it was. We had a young. We had a young receiving group, and I don't want it to seem like either that I'm saying I felt like I was shafted or or one of those <laughs> guys that's like coaches didn't like me. You know, I hate. I hate that type of I don't want to sound like that um but and I'll say this of maybe we had 12 guys in the room 10 10 re receivers in the room I was probably at the bottom of the list when it comes to athleticism I mean we had some stud athletes on our receiving core and I, I again I was from an athletic standpoint, I think I'm pretty athletic and I was probably at the closer to the bottom of the list than wow. I was at the top. However, I knew my assignments and I was going to catch the ball. So where we lacked, which I thought was kind of ironic my senior year, and there were other things that played into it. I ended up getting suspended and, and things like that, that I do think were wrong. I, I'll say that. I, I think I was wrongfully suspended my senior year, but we would be in third and sixth situations and these guys who were younger than me, more athletic, drop passes on third and six. You know, it's maybe we take a shot on first and long to drop a pass. Like those are things that keep drives moving and, and exactly. you really don't kind of, you know, you get a drop and you punt the ball away and then it, the game kind of goes on. But who knows what happens if you get those first downs here and there throughout the year. Exactly. And um, that's where I thought I would have fit, uh, fit into this team. So, um, but yeah, I guess my senior year didn't work out as planned. Like I said, I, I got, um, went through a couple of suspensions that really made me mad and I had nothing I could do about it. It was kind of all she wrote for my football career. Now, you went on to graduate? I did. So I, I actually finished my senior year. So after my senior season, that's when my addiction was at its worst, like that spring semester as a senior. Um, it was like skipping classes, going to class, and then you get sick and, and somebody calls you that has pills and, and you just leave and turn around and go, go meet them. Um, it was bad. It, it was I, that was the worst I had ever been. Now, is, this sounds like if at this point, then it has a potential to pick up because uh, it's kind of funny when, when you're an athlete and your mission is completed, um, it's difficult to get the next mission. And in your case, college is over, football's over, and the next mission is life. Yeah. And it's, it's reality check time. You know, the big leagues are about to start. So you're, you're doing drugs, you graduated, and what becomes of Joey Del Sardo now? I went through my, my um, spring semester of my junior year, 
And I think I withdrew from most of my classes that year. It was bad. Uh, or from that semester, that semester. So I went to summer school and in the middle of summer school, I is when I decided I, I was going to treatment. So I went, I went into treatment June 22nd of 2007. And um, that was obviously the best thing that ever, ever happened to me. And then uh, I took a, I took a semester off that fall and then I finished summer of the next year. I, fin I went spring and summer and finished summer of 2008 um, to get my degree. So yeah, I was fortunate to, to, I guess, go to rehab the time I did and not dig myself in too much of a hole and was able to graduate. Well, you pull it together, so. If you are listening from Australia, Florida, or just from around the corner. From East Coast to West Coast outlets, if you're not to the dirty South straight, make a left body body. Contact us, leave your mark with your host, Vince Cortez. Um, what's going on here then with the uh, the friendships and the people who are being your uh, your suppliers? Yeah, so um, a lot of the people I had a I had a mix, and you know a lot of people say maybe I wouldn't have have gotten into this if I was uh, went to, away to school because a lot of the people that I would you know dealers, suppliers, whatever you want to call it, were people from my high school. As I got worse into it, I then got into just, you know, random cell phone numbers I would have and I would go into, you know, a project area of Pittsburgh and meet whoever, uh, you know, I wouldn't even know who it was. And it got to that point. So it was kind of a mix of people I knew, people I didn't know. Um, and when I went into treatment, I had a cell phone number and, and my parents took my cell phone and they changed it. And uh, I just had a random couple of numbers, my family members. But the last thing I wanted when I got out was to get a phone call from somebody that I didn't want to get a phone call from and me be at a vulnerable time and a difficult time throughout my recovery. And then somebody called me and said, hey, I have this. And now I have maybe a couple bucks in my pocket and I can go get it. Okay. Now you uh, reference that you actually had a, a tipping point moment. Can you share with us what uh, kind of rocked your world and, and, and sent you in the direction of not doing this anymore? Yeah. So, um, so like I said, I, I met with some of these people and, and it's, it's kind of odd how you meet, different people throughout this this world i guess it's kind of like networking with business you know what i mean like you're networking in this underworld type of stuff um so i got this number from a kid who he wrote it down in a notebook in my car and i ca just called this cell phone number i was desperate one day and uh i called it and and there was a like a projects area up by kennywood that i drove up to and I'd been there before and I was just walking around back. So there's like this little courtyard and then there's back, like a back grassway where you can enter into like a back door. And I was walking back there one day and I saw a guy open the door. So I assumed that's who I was meeting. Um, and as I got closer to the door, you know, he pulled a gun and eventually, you know, had the gun in my mouth and was like, what are you, what are you doing here? And at that point I was like, obviously this is the wrong guy, you know? And, uh, I think he figured out, like, I didn't pose a threat. I was terrified. I just put my hands up and I backed up as slow as I could. And I ran further into the project so I could at least meet my dealer before I, you know, <laughs> that actually in the moment it still didn't deter you. You were still looking for your fix. No, I mean, I think you, at that point you're just like so sick and, and you're just so desperate that, and you're that close to getting rid of the sickness, you're like, just, I'm going to go, I'm right here. I'm right here. I don't want to go back and call and go through this whole process of finding something. Wow. Um, so yeah, I met that guy real quick and I, I just ran back to my car and I can remember I was driving home and I actually went into the back seat and I just curled up and was trying to like 
kneel down, but I was like curled up in my back seat and I just started praying. You know, I was like, God, just please give me the strength to quit. Um, Cause I knew at that point, if it, it couldn't, it could have been, you know, very soon that I end up dead if I don't quit. So this is that, amazing. That was my plea. And that was, you know, I just every day. Now, after this happens, so you begin to wean off or you cold turkey or how, how did, I mean, this, this is definitely the moment of which, you know, if you're fearing for your life, it's not going to get any worse than that. Yeah. And you realize you're causing your own problem and you did have the strength before, you know, not yeah. too long ago to, to stop this on your own. So, uh, uh, you know, explain to us, you know, how you began to, to take steps to where you currently are. So I kick, I, I kind of, kind of kick started everything into gear that day. And I did, I started to say, I'm like, I can't live this life. I don't want to go into places I don't know with people I don't meet or, you know, meet people I, I don't know. And it, I was like, I, let me just try and wean myself off. So if I was doing whatever, say it was 160 milligrams a day, let me try doing 120 and, you know, that's going to help me. And then I'm going to spend less money as well. And then, you know, now I'm just going to do 80. And then I tried to get it down to a point where I was, I was doing 40 milligrams. And uh, during all this, it probably was like almost a month long process. And one of my friends from high school who was actually someone who got, you know, gave me that first pill was given dropping off a pill at my house. And it was a pill that actually helps with withdrawal. It was called Suboxone. And uh, I was going outside to get it. And he actually was supposed to put it in my car and he tried putting it in my brother's car. And my brother's car was locked. And my neighbor is a cop and he saw this whole interaction and he got his license plate and, and found out who he was, you know, how found out who the car was registered to. And then I came out and he was like, do you know so-and-so? And I was like, yeah, you know, and my parents went inside at this point, my older brother who was out there went inside. And at that point I just came clean to the cop and was like, listen, I'm not going to answer any questions. Like this, this guy's not a drug dealer you know, I got a, I got a problem and I need help. And, uh, so we started talking and he was like, you know, this is going to be tough, you know, but you're strong. Like I've seen what you did. I know you're strong enough to do it. And that really stuck with me. Um, and then I asked him the big question, like, you know, which was kind of inevitable, but I was like, do we have to tell my parents about this? Oh, wow. And he was like, yeah, you know, and, so walking inside of my house and admitting it to my parents was probably the most difficult thing I had to do. And, uh, we, everybody was, it was kind of crying and, um, you know, my mom obviously knowing me so well had been researching rehabs and the next day I had an evaluation at a treatment center and then, a bed didn't open up. So it was a week later that I got in and, and went to treatment. This is, so your mother sounded like she actually had an idea that something was going on. Oh yeah. I mean, she knew and she would try to catch me in the act, but just couldn't. And, you know, and you go through the, 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 I guess, the reality of it yeah and and I, I think you go through too like everybody knows but i'm just in denial and i'm going to deny everything until the end and it's just the way addicts work you know the, well, and you also still think you have the control you know yeah. I, I you know I, I i can i can still handle this because I, I think a lot of addicts have this idea that they can still be functional and still do their drugs and, and it's just like a, a horrible trick that they play on themselves yeah and um so you go into rehab and 
take me through uh, how rehab plays out. Cause I mean, your story as this thing uh, winds up turns out to be, um, you know, what seems to be tragic and life threatening, you know, walk me through this point of rehab and where where you lined your life up now i mean yeah I, I, and how many years removed are we from this yeah so um well so i went to rehab june 25th 2007 and no drugs no alcohol since then congratulations on that yeah this past june was 13 years that's awesome um thank you and so it was <laughs> I always say about treatment, it was the best thing I experienced that I never want to experience again. Um, you just, you f find out so much about yourself and you're in such a, a, I guess, vulnerable place because you feel all these different emotions that you haven't felt in so long. For me, it was like five years, probably. For some, it could be 25, 30, 40 years of active addiction before they feel different emotions. So it's very, um, it's emotional, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, you can't really sleep because you're still kind of going through these withdrawal symptoms. Um, even though they give you, like they didn't give us Suboxone when I was in treatment. They would treat, like if you had nausea, they'd give you something for that. If you had shakes or chills, they'd give you something for that. So. I wasn't really sleeping well. Um, I would write a lot. I felt a lot of guilt. I felt a lot of shame. You know, my mom and, and my cousin uh, came out to visit me the first week. Once a week, you can have visitors. And um, I, they came out. They had to go through like this class, an hour of Al-Anon type class. And then they could see me. And then I went in on, I think it was a Tuesday. And that Wednesday night was visitation and they came for about five minutes and I was just like, I can't, I can't, like, I can't see you guys. And I asked them to leave and I just felt so bad and I felt so guilty. And one thing about me, as you know, like Italians, we're, we're all close. Like I have 17, there's 17 first cousins in my family. Oh yeah. We all grew up about three, four minutes away from each other. And when I was, when I was going, we would meet for Sunday dinner and breakfast every, every week growing up. So it was Sunday before I knew that I was going, I was going on, I think it was Tuesday, whatever June 22nd was, or June 25th. And it was a Sunday night and I called my whole family up. This is now like 40 people, right? Um, or 30, 30, there's about 30 people and then boyfriends, girlfriends were part of it. But I just said, come up to my mom's, which is right up the block from my grandmother's. And, you know, I'm fighting back tears and everyone's sitting there. And I just said, hey, listen, I've been battling with something for the last five years. And I just want you guys, I, I want to let you guys know that on Tuesday, I'm going to, to treatment. And it was it was so funny it was like so my family but it's like because we would all go to each other's games and uh <laughs> they just stand up and start clapping like you know i just scored a the game winning like touchdown it, it was maybe the biggest score of your life actually looking back yeah so it was funny i mean i always kind of find the humor in things i don't really ever take much offense to anything um so i just i i thought it was a funny funny way like way to react it wasn't like crying or anything i mean there were some of us that were crying but it was just like one of my aunts i think just stood up as like i said if, if, if it was a game and i just scored um and started clapping and it was the start of something good and treatment itself was scary um i'm kind of an introvert vert type person and I walked into this room scared, like you, you know, there's 60 people in there who some have been there for a couple of weeks together and know each other. And I'm walking in, not knowing anyone. And I put a hood up on my head and I walk into this room of 60 people. And immediately somebody says, take your hood off. And I'm like, 
Uh, shoot. Here it goes. Here it comes. <laughs> you thought it was going to be bad in front of your family. You had a whole nother surprise yeah. coming. If you have a story to share, tell us. How are you going to leave your mark? Leave your mark. Contact us. Leave your mark with our host, Vince Cortez. Be our guest. And I'm thinking like, man, this is a bunch of people who are doing drugs before. Like someone walks into the hood up, it's see, nobody's going to care. I just wanted to kind of like hide. And uh, yeah, so immediately I got that. And then, you know, you, you start to learn you start to learn responsibility. So everybody has a job at, at the treatment facility and you could work the kitchen, serving food. You could um, do garbage, which was my first job. Oh man, on a totem pole. They reassign you. So it's like more seniority. You have first pick or second pick, you know, um, you could be picking up like cigarette butts or, or whatever. And, um, so yeah, my first job was taking out the trash and, and then my next job was, I was like, so you'll learn in treatment. I, I'm assuming it's still similar. They, they take away your cell phones and whatnot, but there's pay phones and the pay phones are a big part of treatment. Cause that's like your communication to the outside world. So my second job was, I, you know, timed people in and out for, um, phone calls for phone calls and you got i think 10 minutes it was twice a day and then you have people trying to let me hey let me get five let me get five extra minutes and you know and uh things like that so yeah you learn responsibility you learn how to just do your job um and just learn about addiction you know my my thought process going in was i'm going to go to treatment and i'm going to come out my cousin was going to be getting married right around the time I got it out. And I was like, well, I'll drink and smoke weed. And I didn't even like drinking or smoking weed. I, hate, I hated both of them. I can't stand the smell or taste of alcohol. And I didn't like the effects of marijuana. So I was like, this is what I'll do. And then quickly in treatment, I learned that's not, that's not how it works. And uh, so you learn about addiction and, and ways to cope with it and ways to stay clean. And I just kind of simplified it for myself. They say change the people, places, and things. And that was the biggest thing that I think I took from it. And I took it to heart and I changed those things. And, and then they told us, you know, towards my last day or so, they were given statistics of, hey, how, this, how many of you will stay clean for six months? And, you know, 10% of you will stay clean for 18 months. And then one of you out of 60 will stay clean for five years or more. And I was just like, you know, the, the athletic athlete mentality came out of me and was like, that, that's going to be me. Well, you had a new mission. Yeah. That, that was perfect for you. It, so, it, it matched your, uh, your personality and what you knew you were capable of doing. Yeah. And that's, that's just the way I took it. And you know, we talked on the phone a couple of weeks ago, you and I, and I said, I don't know what anybody else has done, but I know what I've done. And it's been 13 years and I've had, you know, knock on wood, no slip ups. Um, and, and that's the way I continue to do it. And it literally is one day at a time. I could say, Hey, I'm going to be clean for the next 10 years, but I don't know that, you know? Well, your reality of that is, is what's going to help pull you through because you understand the the detail part of it and the one day at time approach. That's that's where you build the strength and your momentum. Mm -hmm. This is this has been awesome, Joey. I really appreciate you coming and sharing this with me. Uh, I would like to um, just kind of give us where you currently are. What what's going on in your life now? What what's yeah. become of you here? We're thirteen years later. Yeah. So I work now. I do sales. Um, I, I won't say for who I don't, I don't want to like, I don't know if there's any company uh, okay. about saying it, but I'm in sales. I'm married, been married for since April 30th of 2016. So like two and a half years now, um, or two and a half, four and a half years. Four now. and a half. Well, you're going to get in trouble for that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have two kids. I have two okay. kids. I have a daughter who's uh, turned three in April and, and then a, a daughter who turned two in June. So, and my younger daughter was actually born on my clean dates, June 25th. So, um, yes, she's a special one then. That's, you know, God yeah. giving you 
you're just there. He's speaking to you in another level there. That's right. That's maybe why she's so bad right now. <laughs> you know, he's, she's he's like your dad? Good. Is she like you? Oh, my gosh. I don't know who she's like, but she is a uh, pistol. And, you know, it's funny that she's bad, but I think she does it just to get a rise out of people. So I guess she is kind of like me because, I, you know, it's, we're Italian. We bust balls. That's just yeah, yeah, that's, what that's, we do. That's what, it, that's what we do. Yeah, that's right. I see it gets to somebody. I just do it a little more just to get a rise out of them. And that's what she does. Like she knows what she's supposed to do and not supposed to do. And she's such a sweetheart. But then it's like, sometimes she's like, I just want to, I just want to bust balls. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's hilarious. Yeah. What This is, this is the best of times now, you know? And it's oh, like, yeah. Uh, you, you did you did want to share with um me that you, you do speaking and I, I wanted you to kind of touch on that too yeah yeah so you're 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 reaching out and giving back forward here yeah um so like probably when I was around three and a half for four years clean you know a teammate of mine um Yogi's his name always would say he wrote a book and, and he had a book signing in Pittsburgh he'd always say tell your story tell your story and I was always kind of hesitant, um, one, to step out into that spotlight and then – or spotlight, whatever light it is. I don't think it would be considered a – Yeah, no, I, it would be. I guess just to go out and, and, and share your imperfections and your mistakes with the world, right? And uh, – or with this small group of people, whatever it may be. And also, too, I didn't feel like for the longest time I was credible enough. Like, I didn't want to be a guy who was saying, well, you know what, I'm, I'm nine months clean. I got to figure it out. Let me go share my story. And I'm not saying that people at that point don't have a story to share because it's extremely difficult to get to nine months, to 30 days, to well, 60 days. But I mean, the courage that's going along with all that, you're, you're, you're dealing with a lot of emotions besides courage, too. You're showing your strength again as well. So I think you're right. You know, that, yeah. that level of confidence isn't there. Yeah. And so it, it took me like three and a half, three and a half, four years to get out there and say, like, this is like, I'm ready to share. And it wasn't like I, I, I sought it out. You know, I did a lot of a lot of praying and eventually some guy just came to me and said, Hey, someone gave me your name, said you might be interested in short sharing a story about addiction. So I'm like, yeah, you know, no idea what I was going to say. I, 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 I came up with this speech. Um, it's evolved obviously as the more I, my, I tell it. And then after a, giving a couple people would come up to me and they'd say, Hey, you know, my, my son is going through, through this like what's your advice and sometimes I wouldn't know what to give because I was the one going through it and they're the ones seeing someone suffer from it so I was like you know I, I don't I don't exactly know like my mom would be a better person to ask than me in that situation but here's what you can do you can love them and try and get them help and I know these places are good avenues to to get help um and then one time a woman came to me and said that her son was, was 23 and, and she thought he was going to die if he didn't get help. And so I gave her the um, number to a guy who actually sent him to a treatment center in Florida. She was like, I need him out of Pittsburgh. He's been everywhere in Pittsburgh. Like he needs to get away. So I helped him get to a place in Florida. And um, like three months later, I was going to talk at some event and the kid tapped me on the shoulder and I didn't know it at the time, but he's like, Hey man, I just want to say my name is, you know, John we'll say, and my mom reached out to you and I just want to thank you. You saved my life. I'm, I'm, you know, three months clean or four months clean. Whatever. Oh, wow. And it was That's like, awesome. right then, I was like, I need to do more. I need to do more of this because if I, one person, like, think about it. If you go to a high school and there's a couple hundred kids or 500 kids, whatever it is, and one person finds something important in your message and, and decides to go this way instead of that way, and look how many lives that touches. Like, for me, I went through this. It affected my, my four people in my house, my two brothers and my parents, my aunts and uncles. You know, that's 10 people. My grandmother, that's 11. My seven, 15 cousins. You know what I mean? And then all the friends in, in 
girlfriends or whoever it else was around me at that time. So um, you affect a lot of people just by making a, a small change. And, and this is a difficult one because it's, it's, it's really like life or death. Um, you never know when you'll get that call that somebody didn't make it because they OD'd or whatever the case is. So that, that one kid coming up to me that one day and, and I had given a handful of speeches at that time, like pushed me forward to, to kind of do it more and, and stay involved in it. So this is, this is a fantastic story, Joey. I appreciate it. All right. Now I, I want to ask you, cause I asked all, all the people that come on, leave your mark. Um, how would you want to be remembered or what would you want your mark to be left in this world? When people say your name, what do they think of Joey Del Sardo? Wow. That's, you know, that's a powerful question. And it's obviously changed. If you would ask me 16 years ago, I would have said, I would like to be remembered as this great athlete, you know, and now I feel like my purpose of going through this was to help people. And I think it's, you know, I'd like them to remember him for helping people battle with their struggles or overcome their struggles, whether it's addiction, whether it's something that they may just not feel comfortable with about themselves or, you know, whatever it is, just that guy helped people. Right on. I love it. Well, Paisan, you did one hell of a job. You, it's good to know you're on the right path too. And I appreciate it. This was really, really good to hear you and on this level, uh, going out of the, the light into the dark and back out into the light. You're, you're a testimony is is good and it's great for people to hear so this is this is going to be really good we want to stay in touch with you yeah and sure. uh you know find out if you're doing any sort of speaking or anything like that let me know because i want to uh, make it available for people that listen to this uh, have access to you and, and what you're up to yeah so I, I appreciate it and uh hopefully once the the COVID times or whatever pass i I had a couple speeches that got, had to go get canceled due to um, the stay at home order. So we'll see, hopefully in the next few months or next year, we'll get, we'll get a chance to do that. it. All right. Great. Thank you. Thanks for listening to leave your mark today. Tune into our next episode of leave your mark with Vince Cortez. Be blessed. You just left your mark. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Listen to more episodes on demand. Just click leave your mark with Vince Cortez.